week, Chad. I well, I hated missing it, but I'm going to have to miss almost all of it because of my grandson and the 4-H. Katie, alcoholic. <clears throat> I think that this is my opinion, so whatever. Uh, I think that uh, emotional sobriety, when Bill talked about emotional sobriety, I think it is the third step. The third step carries into the fourth step, which carries into the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh, and twelve, of course. But we call it the second surrender. Uh, most of us come in working a program based on the abstinence of alcohol. And you can work a program based on the abstinence of alcohol for a long time. And you're living a life on self-will. Just go into any AA meeting and you're, you know, you can pick us out because we're just so obvious, right? We're strongly opinionated. We're hard-headed as hell. And we're going to get whatever we want. And and I was a card-carrying member of that for many, many years. So when the book says... It's I I like uh, bottom of sixty and page sixty one. Charlie will hit sixty two uh, more. Is it, it talks about the first requirement is that I have to be convinced that any life run on self will can hardly be a success. Well, I'm not. I mean, that answer to that question for most of us is we're not. Um, follow me around. I'm, I'm going to get to the front of the line. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to go where I need. I'm going to blow my horn. I'm going to get past that. I'm going to run that yellow light. You know, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get whatever I need to get. But the part that's so cool is over on 64. If you flip over there to the second paragraph down, or excuse me, uh, yeah, I thought it was 64. Uh, yeah, second paragraph down that starts out with we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. Here's the important part of this one. It says being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. So it's telling me by this page, they're thinking I'm convinced of how self shows up. Now we're going to do the inventory, which is really my DNA, how Katie shows up, because I may show up different than you. I, I'm a strong willed woman. And I'm going to give you my opinion. You may be like Eeyore and wouldn't say Pete. It doesn't matter. It's just the different way self shows up. So it's saying in these four pages, we hope we've convinced you of the many different ways that self shows up. And then it goes, it gives us our two things we're looking for, right? We're the actor running the whole show, trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, try, trying to get your family in order, do all that stuff. And then I have this delusion that if everybody would do as I wish, the show would be great. Everyone, including me, would be happy. Now, here's what's really wild. It's getting ready to tell me I am never satisfied. I am constantly in a state of discontent. I am restless. I am irritable and I am discontented. And let me tell you something. I really believe most alcoholics are. They have that low-grade fever, and they start their day out with that low-grade fever. Doesn't mean you don't wake up in a good mood. Doesn't mean you're a real jerk. But we we, we go up. We either go up to happy, joyous, and free, or we go down to the four horsemen, right? I mean, it, it's a it's a you know it, it's a tough spot, and a lot of people aren't willing to admit that. And they say they're fine, but I I say let let's spend a day together and let's see how how fine you really are. Because the truth of the matter is, is if you're not doing these disciplines of ten and eleven. And I mean deep disciplines. You and you be the real alcoholic, then you, you know you, you you can go to a deep depression, or you can be a real jerk in the world. And so then it says, so we've got this this. Uh, my motive is always stellar, right? Oh my God! If everybody, I'm the actor running the whole show. Then I've got the delusion if everybody would do as I wish, and I filter my actions through there. The worst I'm going to come up with is a is an A minus. I mean, come on, guys. I know the best way to get about this. And that's what we do, right? That's We don't see because it's all behind a kind motive. It's what the third step's trying to wake me up to. The new guy, we teach him integrity, dignity, honor, respect. Very important. But what he doesn't understand is now he's going to be helpful. He's going to do this for the meeting. He's going to mop the floors and he's going to do this. And then in about 18 months, he realizes that people are taking advantage of it. And he doesn't realize that he's done it behind the kind motive. So that's kind of what we're trying to wake people up to is, is we alcoholics think we're just so stellar and, and, and we are so self-righteous in that area. You know, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't talk to somebody like that because I've been sober six years. But before that, I was, I was a really ugly speaker, right? We always think it's just our drinking. So then it goes into the toolkit of self-will there, right? 
kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing, right? That's fine. I'll stay here. You guys go ahead. And then if I don't get my way, I get mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But here's the paragraph. If you ask me, this is the 10th step right here, right? If we're watching for resentment, dishonest, selfish, and uh, uh, afraid, this is what is happening in the day. So it says, when a sponsee calls you with the 10th step, so, so what happened? Well, the, the show didn't come off like I thought it would. That's what they're going to say. I'm pissed off at my sister. I said this, she said that, and I can't believe she said that because she always says it. There you go. Same old drill. And it says, he begins to think life doesn't treat him right. That's where the self-pity comes in. And, and trust me, if it says in the morning, we're to ask to be divorced from self-pity is the first thing, dishonest and self-seeking motives, we all must have self-pity. Right. Open your eyes tomorrow morning and ask yourself, what's the first thought that goes on? I don't want to get out of bed. I really don't. I'd like to stay in bed another hour. I don't care what I need to do. So self-pity is typically what we have. It says he decides to exert himself more. Now, here comes the driven by the fear. On the next occasion, he's still more demanding or gracious. There's the toolkit of self-will. Right. I'm going to be either demanding or I'm going to say, hey, oh, Mary, hey, I get it. I know I've been asking a lot of you, but if you could do this last thing for me, man, I'd be so appreciative, right? Coming at you. And then Mary says no, and I'm like, all righty. Next time you ask me for something, I won't be doing that. I mean, that's what I'm saying in my head. So that's where we go. And then it says still the play doesn't suit her. Why? Because we're never content. I, I can get everybody to do what I want. And then I think, yeah, no, no, no. I, I kind of kind of want them to do this and that. maybe, And that's what we end up doing. We are never satisfied. Admitting we may be somewhat at fault, we're sure others are more to blame. It talks in the book about blaming others as far as most of us ever get on page 66, 67. Watch yourself how much you blame. Just wake up to it. You know, I mean, we are blamers, judgers and blamers. It just is. It's just the mind. You don't get that in my person. You know, I talked to him. You'd never know I'm thinking that, but that's what I'm thinking. I'm judging you and I'm blaming you. That's, and if you're in a relationship with somebody, trust me, it's the, it's a driving force, uh, but you may not be acting it out. This is all in your thinking. Uh, still the play doesn't suit. Okay. Then it says he becomes angry, indignant, self-pity, angry, column one, indignant, column two, self-pity, column three. We, we try to get, or excuse me, uh, angry, column two, in, indignant, column three, and self-pity, column four. So it's setting us up right there to do inventory. It says, what's his basic trouble? Is he really not a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? And the word kind in the dictionary says useful. So it's trying to tell us this was behind a good motive. You didn't go in there to, to yell at somebody. If you yelled at somebody, you know you got to make an amends. But this is when you came at it with a kind motive. It says, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he just manages well? There's so much going on there. Victim means trick, tricked or duped by my delusional mind, which is not denial. I don't have the definition of delusion. Maybe uh, you guys could look it up and read it in a minute. And then to rest means to seize by force. Satisfaction means being right and happy. And let me tell you, we really want to be right. And if happiness comes with it, well, by God, today's a good day. <laughs> I'll take them both. But we want to be right. That is, that is, I just want everybody to say, oh, my, my God, Katie, you were right. I, well, of course I knew I was right, you know, but, but I'd be going, oh, wow, okay. You know, you're not going to see that behavior. I mean, you might. Charlie will, but the, mo- the majority of the world will not see that behavior. It says, is it not evident? Now, this is another one that a lot of people miss. Is it not, is, is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things he wants? And don't they wish, don't their actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can out of the show? Is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? So have you ever seen somebody come in and they're working an angle and you see the angle and you know exactly what they're trying to do and you want to just cut their legs out from underneath them? Well, Watch out, because that's what we do, okay? We are doing the same thing, but we don't see it because that's why we have to have the 10th step. We've got to have another set of eyes watching us. So that I hope I didn't go on too long. Thank you, Chad. Real honor.
Katie, thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate kind of spur of the moment. And we're, I, I was scrolling through, and you were getting a lot of laughs through that through people listening to this. I think I think for some of you guys out there, that might have been hitting home. I mean, I'm I'm not that way, but all right, Charlie, would you mind uh, chiming in a little bit on on page sixty two that you missed last well, week? I don't know. I mean, she went on so long. I I hope I don't go on like that when I have thirty seven years. I uh, I'll tell you, I so. It'll make more sense to you, honey, in about five and a half months. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, it's funny because I'm just going to recap a little bit of what Katie said. Um, no, I'm kidding. But we've, we've had so many fights and workshops because she'll do the first half of the first step, and then I come in right behind her and want to recap. Recap. Word for wanna... word, he'll recap it. <laughs> yeah, try to mansplain it. But, uh, but you know, if... I think one, I think we may have talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but if there's any mistakes being made in AA, assuming there are any, one of the biggest ones I see is for a lot of people, a third step is a third step prayer. And it comes as a result of saying, are you an alcoholic? Do you believe in God? If so, then let's get you down on your knees and do a third step prayer. And you skip this body of work in pages 60 to 63, and it's just the most pivotal point in the book. And, and when I meet somebody that's been around for a minute or that's been in and out for a minute, these are the pages we're going to go to if I'm trying to give them a new experience. These, for most of us, a different approach to these steps can really have a pivotal change on my approach to sobriety, my approach to inventory, my approach to, and, and a, a big chunk of it is this thing about what we call the self piece and because I missed it for so long. And and when you go back in there, now all of a sudden, all this stuff that she was just going over makes so much sense, but it has to be broken down for me. You know, Mark Houston used to say, giving me this book and expecting me to get it is like giving me the flight manual to an F-16 fighter jet and saying, now, once you've read this, we have one out in the parking lot, you know, try not to hurt yourself or anyone else when you're flying it. I need somebody to break it down for me. And uh, the, this first requirement, the, the motives, the toolkit of self-will, what usually happens, and it switches over here at the bottom of 61, where it says our actor is self, self-centered, egocentric. Two. The first new paragraph says, it's huge. It says selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Our founders are saying that the root of their tr- our troubles is selfishness and self-centeredness. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. I step on people's tongues and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt me, right? I didn't do nothing. But it says we invariably find a place to ourselves. We've made decisions based on self that placed us in a position to be harmed. And here's one of the biggest promises in the big book. It says, so our troubles, they think, we think, are basically of our own making. Basically being where the underlying foundation, the fundamental problem is that my troubles are basically, they arise out of myself. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. I wish I had time to... We have the, the, the greatest graphic about that that line right there. Um, I'll try to do it super fast. Because when I read that, I don't think I'm an extreme example of self will run right. But imagine if this screen represented the whole population of the United States, right? Or wherever you are. And we're going to go into that population. We're going to build a big 20 foot high fence with barbed wire and stuff over in the corner. We're going to go into the population and we're going to get all the people that are self-will run riot. Not just self-will, but self-will run riot. And we're going to herd them into that fence. Right? So now you're getting an idea of that population in there? Now we're going to go inside the fence and we're going to pluck out the extreme examples from that community. The ones that are driving the other self-will run riot people crazy, we're going to pluck them out and get them into a group, right? Are you getting a picture of that? You know who that group is? 
Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and the problem is, I don't think I even belong in the fence because of my motives and the stuff that Katie was talking about. Well, I think when you come to get me out of the fence, you think I'm thinking, well, I know I look bad there for a minute, but you probably heard my story now and my explanation. And you realize that I really wasn't that selfish. That I was trying to do a good thing and I'm surrounded by a bunch of idiots that I can barely work with. So that's why I'm in the fence. But really, if you heard my story, you'd understand. And that is my whole life, everywhere. I want to talk about my motives and, and what I was trying to do. And uh, so when we get it down here, it says there's a, a bunch of stuff in here where it says, above everything, we must be rid of this selfishness. We must, where it kills us. And over and over in the book, it brings us to a point where it says, here's the problem, Charlie. Do you admit that it's uh, objectionable? And if yes, well, guess what? You can't do a darn thing about it on your own power. And over and over again, the book brings me to a problem, shows me my lack of power, and it brings me to a point of surrender. It says, and there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. God makes that possible. We can have moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we can't live up to them. I can't have this conversation go, by God, you know, that lady from Texas is right. I am going to be less self-centered. It's in my DNA. My first, and it, I was, if you don't think there's any lingering selfishness or self-centeredness with the stuff that caves on, how would you like the idea of having a couple of loudspeakers connected to your brain that broadcast your thoughts as you move through the world on a daily basis. It's like, oh my God, I'd, I'd be in a padded room by sundown, you know. And, but that's not what people hear. You know, they hear, well, thank you and have a nice day. You know, but um, so it goes on to say, we had, but then it switches, you know. Over on 60, it says, just what do we mean by that? And just what do we do? Well, from that point to right now, they've been talking about what we mean. And then it switches to what we do. Right here at the bottom of 62, where it says, this is the how and why. First of all, we got to quit playing God. It didn't work. And next we decided, so here's the decision in the third step. It's not in the prayer. The prayer is a reiteration of this decision I made at the bottom of 62. And it says, we decided... The hereafter in this drama life, God's going to be our direction. The, the deal that we make in step three is that I am no longer in management. I'm not really, right? That's the deal we make in the, in, in the third step. And it says, it gives me some examples. He's the principal, we are his agents. He's the father, we are his children. This concept was the keystone to, of the arts. To, and then it, at the top of 63, this is what we call the pivot point in Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything we've been doing up to now leads to this paragraph, and everything we're going to do from here forward refers back to this paragraph. It says, when we sincerely took such a position, what position? The position that God's in charge, and that suits me just fine. All sorts of remarkable things happen. You know, on page 46, it says we find that God doesn't make too hard of terms for those that seek him. Well, the deal is that I'm no longer playing God, and the terms are right here, and they're very simple. It says we had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed. So that's God's job. He's going to provide what I need under two conditions. If I keep close to him and I perform his work well. Now, the amazing thing, is that from here on out, there's nothing else. Everything everything we do from here on out is about staying close to him or performing his work well. And it turns out I can't stay close to this power until I get close to this power. And I can't get close to this power when I'm blocked. So the next thing we're going to do in this biggest course of action is try to remove at least enough of what's blocking me from the only solution that I've admitted will work for me. And that's what we're going to try to do in, in the inventory process. And so then we do the third step prayer. And think about it. Over on 64, it says, our decision was vital and crucial, but it could have little permanent 
effect unless it wants followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. That's what it's talking about there. And, it, and, it, and that thing that Katie said is so powerful. It says in the third, second new paragraph, first we searched out the flaws which had caused our failure, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what had defeated us. We considered self's common manifestation. So over on 60, it says the first requirement is that I be convinced. And here on 64, it says being convinced. So those pages that I skipped for 17 years are designed to convince me that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. It's an enormous shift in my approach to sobriety. When Katie said that up to that, she worked with uh, a program based on, that, on not drinking, it's all over, eh? but they, now we're looking at manifestations of self and the way self shows up and what's it like to be with me? What's it like to you know, work for me, work with me, be married to me, right? be my friend, be my sponsee, my, you know, and, and it, it just, it changes the sobriety picture to this a much bigger uh, stage of the ways that self manifest and um, that's really about all I got though my favorite story though is one time I was doing this with a guy and he said you know I don't really have this selfishness that you're talking about I said oh okay that's interesting and, and about a year later it, my phone rang and when I answered the phone he goes when does the selfishness stop and I know this was nine years ago because I said buddy I don't know the answer to that but I know it's more than 27 years, you know, because it's still all over me, you know, and sometimes I'm still shocked by how self-centered my first thought can be. So it's a pivot point that moves us into, and it changes the whole vigorous course of action since four through nine. And it's what we talk about all the time. So I really appreciate you indulging me and letting me go on about that. And thanks for the opportunity to chat.